Hello and welcome to a special discussion for Productivity Awareness Week. Productivity Awareness Week is spearheaded by the National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, the NCPC, to boost awareness of issues surrounding competitiveness and productivity in St. Lucia by increasing the dialogue between public and private sectors in an effort to find creative solutions. The theme for this year's observance is embracing excellence through research and innovation, a very interesting topic. And we've brought together a panel of experts in the business sector, science and technology, education and research and policy to discuss the topic, how can we achieve a more competitive St. Lucia? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So Good morning. I, I intended to introduce you, but I think I want you to introduce yourselves. I'm going to change it around because I want us to have a discussion. I want you to, persons to get to know who you are and your level of expertise. So let me start off immediately to my right, Mr. Harris. Hi, I'm Kurt Harris, Dean of the Division of Technical Education and Management Studies. I'm also a member of Valeri, the Von Arthur Lewis Institute for Research and Innovation with responsibility for engineering research. That's a lot. Yep. <laughs> <coughs> uh, I'm Paula James, the Executive Director of St. Lucia Manufacturers Association. Um, I manage the group of manufacturers island-wide with about 78 um, companies, large, medium, and micro. And in our terminology of large, that's about two, 350 persons max. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm Berthia Thomas, Science and Technology Officer within the Department of Sustainable Development. I am the sole officer in the unit. So it is a unit in every sense of the word. Um, the unit has five major responsibilities. Uh, the first one being data management, collaboration, which is why we're here today, research and development, uh, science and technology popularization, and just establishing policy and the institutional framework for science and technology in St. Lucia. That's a lot for one person. Yes, yeah, so we we'll do a lot of collaborative work, so it's a okay. partnership. All right, thanks. Hi, uh, good day, everyone. I am Janai Leos, the Chief Economist in the Research and Policy Unit in the Department of Finance. It's a relatively small unit with 10 persons, and we are really responsible for guiding uh, government policy and doing some of the data analysis on what not on various <coughs> policy. We also work closely with the NCPC and we are actually this year for the second time going to have a research symposium as part of that week where we'll like to showcase to the public some of the work that we have done uh, on issues such as unemployment, health and a wide range of, uh, of societal issues. So we encourage everyone to be a part of that as well. And I didn't introduce myself, so I am Glenn Simon. I'm your moderator, but I'm also the communication specialist of the NCPC. And our question, let me just remind everybody, one is how do we achieve a more competitive St. Lucia? But I want to start off first by asking, as a country, are we focused on competitiveness in our various sectors? And anybody could start off. I, I don't want to pick on anybody. I would start off by saying, though, we are not Bye. focused. And the reason being is that in manufacturing, everything is a cost. To be competitive and productive, you must manage that cost. And um, our electricity, our fuel, mm. is the biggest hindrance in manufacturing. It is exorbitant. And if we have to be competitive to the likes of our neighbors, there's no way we can compete with that because they have oil, they cost is after it's low it's subsidized and then we have the struggle of trying to manage that cost locally and then on top of that you have legislation that keeps going on for years and years and years so as a sector in manufacturing being competitive is a tough one to haggle with and we do our best to ensure that our product however is of a standard. Everybody who manufacture a product, we ensure that they have some sort of standard. So that's our competitive edge, having a good quality and standard. What about the education sector? Are we being competitive? Um, <coughs> are we being competitive? The answer to well, that is there question a focus on, maybe, on yes. There is. 
but are we focusing on being competitive mm -hmm. is a different answer altogether. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you could be competitive without necessarily deliberately looking or trying to be competitive. You're just competitive as a matter of fact as to what exists within the, the, the construct. I don't think it's a focus that we have. I think um, generally in the education sector, we are focusing on maintaining, ensuring mm -hmm. that everything doesn't fall apart as opposed to focusing on competitiveness. Um, competitiveness for me requires, uh, it's a lot more involved process. It's a process where there needs to be a lot more participation from the education sector with the sectors that it serves, which is the entire um, society. And generally, by and large, the education sector is separated from all other activities that take place. So we do not interact sufficiently with the private sector, nor the public sector. The education sector in and of itself is, is a standalone mm -hmm. activity that does not find enough participation from the other sectors involving both in terms of ensuring that they help fund education as well as direct the education sector. There is that disconnect and, and that is what you need, that connectivity, to ensure that the sector becomes competitive. Now, I, I, it's good <coughs> that we have um, Mr. Leos on, yes, on board I because I think it's important because Comment. research and policy mm -hmm. plays such a pivotal role in helping to shape um, this and I, I, I don't know if you'll counter what you said. Uh, no, um, <laughs> I, I think when, when, when you look at competitiveness or you look at productivity, you always hear that competitiveness or productivity is really the way you achieve in a particular end and how well you achieve in that particular end or that particular outcome. I think what is an, an issue in our space is what are the outcomes that we are working towards. Having a clear sense as to what the outcome is provides you with some level of focus. And with that level of focus, you can now work towards achieving that outcome that you have set yourself to a bit better. I think research comes in in showing the array of options or outcomes that are on the table and then saying this particular outcome vis-a-vis -vis that one may be best in our circumstance. So we, we have done and we are conducting research on a number of, of issues. If you look at the determinants of unemployment, that is something that, that we, we looked at last year as well. If you look at wage or gender income inequality, that is something that we looked at last year as well. Once you have a sense as to what are the issues at play and you have a clear, clean sense of what those issues are, you can then now focus on outcomes to alleviate those issues. But you need research to highlight and to clarify and to sort of allow you to ration through and say, okay, these two areas are our areas of focus because the research has shown that these two provide the highest value in our space. Then now you can work towards becoming more competitive by focusing on those two areas. In the absence of that, what do you focus on? Do you start on product design first or product development first? Do you focus on sensitizing your market first? Having some sequence of events, having some research that shows you what the different options are and what may be best and when, it allows you to focus better and from that focus, you could then truly become more competitive because you're working towards an end point. But it, it's still, I understand what you said, the theory is great, but mm -hmm. it doesn't address what was just said by Mr. Harris, that there seems to be a standalone with the education <laughs> system. Yeah. It's not is, connected. Research is. ideally should be a participatory process between all stakeholders. Yes. So if I'm trying to figure out what are the ways to improve the quality of our students in terms of maths, or English, or what have you. There is scope for not only your educators, but for your social workers, for your health planners, and whatnot, because education and educational outcomes are tied to the health of the students, the societal backgrounds that they're coming from, and a whole host of other issues. So if we were to truly research that issue, all of those stakeholders would be involved in that. And in doing so, you get the participation that, that, that we spoke about earlier, and then Research itself is part of, is part of ed ed education. Mm -hmm. So you would get that participation and you will get that, that sort of buy-in between all stakeholders. But there is not a sufficient level of, 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 of research on, on the island. And as a result of that, persons don't reach across the aisle, as it were, to say, hey, I have this issue. 
And I think the issue I'm having, you may be contributing or can assist in that issue. So I was going to ask you whether you were satisfied with the level and, qu and quantity, quality of research on Ireland. So I guess you've hinted to it. But I want to go to Ms. Berthia, um, Ms. Berthia and talk about science and technology. And how does it play that connecting role within the country to help boost the country's competitiveness? Yes, I wanted to somewhat uh, disagree with what Mr. Jelani said because... Jelani. J Janai, I'm <laughs> yes, sorry. That's right, that's right. <laughs> okay, research, but research to what end? Yeah. I cannot help but associate research with development. Are we conducting research in, in a vacuum? To date, the government of St. Lucia doesn't have a national policy for science, technology, and innovation. There's no strategy and no action plan. So are we operating in a vacuum? Are we doing things ad hocly? Or are we truly working towards a purpose? In the absence of a policy, your goals may be beautiful, <coughs> but they may or may not move forward because there's no overarching framework or no umbrella, you know, guiding what we do. Now, I, I, I cannot separate science and technology from research and development. Yes. I mean, science in the most basic the most basic definition is making inferences from your natural environment through observation and experimentation and technology is taking that knowledge that we have gained and making life better helping solve complex problems how do we do that through research that leads to development research as the name implies very science oriented but development is then taking that science and translating it into services and products that we can now commercialize i also don't agree that everybody can do research while it's a participatory process and you would go to persons to collect that research i think research should be housed in a in a designated a designated body, a designated authority with persons equipped with the tools and the, the finances to actually conduct that research to an end, to commercialize products so that, I mean, people can get value for their ideas and their, I don't think it's enough to just do research because we want to find out how this, how is Sagasum affecting the coast mm -hmm. of, the, the eastern but coast of St. Lucia. But with that information, what then can you do about it? I, I always see research as leading to an outcome, as, uh, as was well what. Yeah. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So I, I don't just totally uh, disagree uh, with everything you said. <laughs> that's, that's where the competitiveness comes, comes about, because if, if you have a sense as to the outcome that I would like to, to achieve, then there are different ways within which you could achieve that outcome. And over time, what you are trying to do is to not only achieve that, account, that outcome, but achieve it better, quicker, faster higher quality and that chain of events is what you really call productivity because productivity right. is the how you are achieving that particular outcome and you're mm -hmm. working towards achieving that particular outcome as so best as you can but to answer so, so let me let me i know yeah. you want to jump in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because i listen to you jelani and i listen to i'll give you a typical for. example okay to be competitive, you need to get things. And in the business sector, mm. it's now, now. Mm -hmm. You cannot wait with a business six months to find okay. somebody to do a particular job. Mm -hmm. So we have been asking for years, mm -hmm. where can I call if I want to find, let's say, 10 welders? Mm -hmm. Which department can help me? Yes. So in our mind, we thought the most logical person may have been Sir Arthur Lewis. Mm -hmm. They don't keep that information. Now we have said that to minister after minister, government after government. So we need a skills bank. The skills bank. And this is what we've been asking for. So when I hear an em unemployment, mm -hmm. there is work out there. But to get that job, you have to advertise. Mm -hmm. You have to wait maybe four or five weeks and we don't read. <laughs> so <laughs> my friend is nodding his head. <laughs> so <laughs> where do you put this information? Everybody says there's no work and that's not true. That's not so to me, it, it's disheartening when I think of a manufacturer looking for a particular skill. And then right now we're on to investment, investment. I can guarantee you if an investor asks anybody now in government, where can I find 22 research officers? Yeah. Let's use research officers. Yeah. 
-hmm. Not even let's go research technology, let's go I am in a lab. I need to open a business mm -hmm. and I need a lab. Mm -hmm. And I want 22 of those persons. Mm -hmm. Where do I get that information? Yeah. So let me just, just um, put a, a pin right there. Um, we are on to our first break. So we go to our first break, but when we come back, we will go straight into our very first clip to talk exactly what you're saying there because we have a clip with the manufacturers, the, the, not the manufacturers, it is the Employers Federation talking about the skills that they cannot find in St. Mm -hmm. Lucia and how the education sector mm -hmm. probably has <coughs> not helped. Mm -hmm. So we go to the break and then we, we introduce that clip before we come to the panel. Okay. I'm innovative. I'm competitive. I am productive. I'm creative. I constantly improve what I do. And how I do it. I provide excellent customer service. I never stop learning. I give up my best, always. The National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, embracing excellence. Well, first we must begin with a look at the raw material, the students coming out of school. And in general, employers believe that they come out of school and they're not ready for the world of work. So in other words, it's a reflection of our curriculum. We definitely need to work on the curriculum, particularly the soft skills. So that is critical because with the raw material, you can mold it into whatever you want. Second, we are very limited by what, by resources. And um, we have some strengths, particularly in the agricultural sector. So we believe in particular that um, agriculture is the way to go. Um, it would feed into our tourism industry. At the same time, we could also um, develop quite a bit of employment through agro-processing. Um, and agro-processing could involve um, fish as well, uh, um, particularly sea moss and these kind of things. But the key for me as, um, is really, it really has to begin with the curriculum. As we look at it from the perspective of an educational institution, it is all about creating a mindset we have to ensure that we are able to create, to have what we consider creative citizens. And creative citizens need a training. And so if we are going to look at getting in the direction of competitiveness, that has to be high on our agenda. The sorts of training that we give, the skills that we will try to develop, we have to get out of the box. And we have to now look at how we can ingrain in our human resource that aspect of getting out there and being competitive and it starts with having a creative mindset now that's a good way to come back in and we heard some <coughs> critical points that the raw materials spoken of the schools how are we preparing our children and i know that that could mention it but would you like to respond to that that comment that the raw material is lacking i mean it's 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 a very common comment that a lot of persons make. Um, to a large extent, I think it is somewhat inaccurate. Um, in a lot of discussions with a lot of employers, one of the things that a lot of employers want is a fit for purpose. No educational institution creates fit for purpose individuals. Employers must recognize that they play a role in training. When anybody comes out of an educational institution, you as an employer must train because you will have your approaches and things that you will do. The concept that the curriculum and soft skills, a lot of people speak about soft skills. Soft skills is not an educational, institutional issue. True. This is a societal flaw yeah. that must be developed from homes. Educational institutions should help enhance soft skills. But our soft skills gap or dearth that we are suffering right now is a cultural malaise. Mm -hmm that we practice bad manners <laughs> as a people. <laughs> we do, we jump the line. We do things which are wrong and we show the young people. We stop and we urinate anywhere. Th this is not a thing that the educational sure. institution can correct in and of itself and by itself. 
because the same people who teach in the educational institutions may be suffering from the same soft skills <laughs> that everybody else wants them to inculcate in people that in children that they are not helping to do hence the reason why i spoke about the connectivity that needs to exist between all of the other sectors and the educational institutions if we are to achieve that as it relates to curricula <coughs> curricula is something that does not happen in and of itself by itself the educational institution will not know exactly what the institutions want. So you have to ask the Employers Federation, has the Employers Federation ever gone to, let's say, a Arthur Lewis Community College and had an audience with them and say, hey, guys, let's meet. This well, is I'll what I'll I would like to ask you now, have they gone? Because you're the dean, well, never especially met, if they I've, ne I've never met with them. I've <coughs> never met with, I mean, the only organization that we, have, we meet with on a regular basis that participates with us very actively is the SLHTA. And in more recent time, we've had a number of the, the larger garages interacting with us in that regard. But um, at one point in time, years ago, we had what we call advisory committees where private sector individuals sat on advisory committees assisting. What happened was that persons found that it was taking up too much of their time. They didn't want to invest that time to do that sort of work. So the advisory committees slowly but surely died out because nobody found it was, it was a waste of their time. It wasn't making money for them. So what you find happening now, 10, 15 years later, you don't have that interaction anymore. Bec and the same persons now say, oh, but nobody are asking us because, guys, you stop participating in the processes that helped ensure that the college produced closer to what the they industry required. Wait, than what is happening. Well, you have Paula right here. <coughs> Paula, it's, a, it's, it's an opportunity to see whether or not that cry is fair or not, because this has been said in several different fora that our education system does not prepare our students for the world of work. Is it, is it still accurate, or do you side with Mr. 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 Harris? I agree with Mr. Harris, especially the first point about um, soft skills. It is a thing that it has nothing to do with um, curriculum. Because I remember in another role that I did, simple things like telling people, good morning. You walk into a room, it doesn't take anything out of you to say good morning. Are they supposed to teach you that in the curriculum? Yeah, no. I Thank you. Have a nice day. Simple yeah. things. And uh, you have to feel, for you to want to do something in life, you have to feel good about yourself. But I get a sense that's not what the... Hello, the, yes, what my boy. speaking of. No, because <laughs> soft skills <laughs> is about that. Yeah. Customer nice. service. That's customer <coughs> service. In any business, you walk into a place, you expect to get customer... You would like to walk into a store and it happens, eh? It happens in government offices too. Somebody on a phone or two people talking and you like a piece of furniture nobody's seen you. Yes. And also so I, I take the point of things like initiative and wanting to do things that aren't necessarily part of your original job description. These type of things are lacking and employers cannot find persons with that sort of skill. And no, no, but, but the employers train, eh? They train. Because you come in to do a job, a particular job, they will train you. They won't just push you in it and leave you there. But the soft skills thing is something that keeps being talked about all the time. Mm -hmm. But he's quite right. Yes. And I think you, you hinted at the, the, the cornerstone of, of competitiveness or productivity. You must first want to actually do mm -hmm. better in order to mm -hmm. do better. If, if, if productivity and competitiveness is that sort of, <coughs> that sort of uh, doing better, doing more with the same resources, we have always had the discussion that that just is innate to everyone. But unless you want mm -hmm. to do more with less, yeah. and unless you want to get better, unless you want to achieve this outcome, then competitiveness and productivity ends there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think what, what we are hinting at is that the first step or the cornerstone of productivity, the first cornerstone of competitiveness, is a desire to want to be better yes. in the first mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. And that, as, as Mr. Harris said, may not necessarily be something that comes from the educational system, system, but that innate desire to be better and to do better comes from a more societal yeah. basis, more yeah. so than necessarily education yeah. system. So, yeah. 
the, f the cornerstone for us in terms of competitiveness is how do you get your populace to want better for themselves and for others as well. And that then mm -hmm. becomes step one in a series of steps towards becoming more competitive and more productive. I, I just want to caution on one thing. The, the construct of do more with less is something we must guard very carefully because there's this belief that you can consistently do more with less. Mm -hmm. On any productivity or efficiency scale, mm -hmm. there is a point at which you need a minimum amount of resources to be able to mm -hmm. do. But uh, we also use it as, a, as an escape go to say, do more with less, do more with less. So they give you nothing and they just expect a lot more out of it. Yeah. So I, I try not to use those catchphrases, do more with less, because it tends to make people believe that they can give you absolutely nothing and expect with a miracles. lot out of it. With but miracles. there is efficiency and productivity curves that insist mm -hmm. that for you to be at your maximum efficiency and productivity, there's a minimum amount of resource, a minimum right. amount of support that yeah. must be given. Yeah. Yeah. Below and above that, you're inefficient, full mm -hmm. stop. Mm -hmm. So yes, we need to be able to be more efficient, mm -hmm. more productive, but I... I Despise that phrase. <laughs> Do more with less. So, Bertha, you wanted to add. So yes, well. I, I noticed <coughs> that the gentleman on the, the video, he mentioned creativity as well. And I remember speaking to Mr. Harris, and he gave this very powerful example. The child is young and he's outspoken and boisterous and active, and you say, sit down and be quiet, go in a corner. And he does that again, sit down and be quiet. And then when he's a teenager and he, he's sitting in the class and he doesn't care to contribute and he's uninterested, you're wondering what these children are so unmotivated, they're so not creative, they, they're lazy, but have we in ourselves crushed that, that creativity, that, that Gina, it's been genius socialized to, to stay yeah, in the so, corner. So a, a good class is a, when you do classroom management is one where everybody's seated and the, their hands are on their lips. And I mean, I have a four-year-old boy and he doesn't always do that. And the teacher would tell me, I have to keep him for lunch. You know, he couldn't go out to play because he was so boisterous and stuff. And I'm, I'm at a, a place where I'm wondering, am I, am I to discipline him and tell him he must always have his hands on his lips? Or should I tell him to express himself and r run the risk of getting in trouble because I don't want to kill his creativity you know <laughs> so sometimes <laughs> I, I think we need to where where are, are we playing integral roles in in killing the child's genius from young and then we complain later that that is uh, that maybe that's one of the reasons why the the level of competitiveness in St. Lucia doesn't seem to be what we want the optimum level it hasn't been reached now there is a role for data in this whole um, discussion mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. discussions like this we've had for a long time but um, I want to introduce the second clip that we have and it, it really speaks to issues of data and the mindset that has been spoken of so if we just play that at a clip for, uh, for us right now well my passion is data I think that basically we need to get all agencies speaking to each other I think we need to have a central database I think we need to bring everybody's ideas together and record them and I, so we can cross-reference everything and take a look at everything I mean it's all good and, and well talking about things but you know we're hearing the same questions being asked over and over again those answers need to be tabulated and put into some sort of data storage so that we can look at it and all of us can speak the same language. We go from institution to institution and you hear everybody setting up their individual databases when all of these databases should be interlinked and available to everybody, I mean, accepting confidential information. So, you know, I remember Al Gore speaking about the information superhighway in the 90s and how it would change the world. Well, we can change Sanusha just by getting all our data collated and making it accessible to everybody. So ideas can germinate and people can know where to get advice and information on, on how to move forward. And I think that's really our biggest problem. Until and unless we have that long-term vision, and long-term, as I said, 15, 20 years, and no matter what side of the political divide we are, to see our Saint Lucia grow. What exactly is our, is our long-term development of the agenda, which will then determine the kinds of skills that, our, that we need, skills that we can invest in, to train our people in, so that when they come back home, there's a job for them that matches what they've been trained. And I'm not talking about in five-year silos as is the norm in the, our normal political structure. In order for us to increase our competitiveness, we first all need unity of purpose, understand where we want to be as a people. What do we want for ourselves? 
how would this impact on the quality of my life, my standard of living? And then we address how do we get there? Improving our competitiveness is a very complex matter. A multitude of strategies need to be involved, the entire country. And so I would say it first starts off in the mind, believe it or not. The cultural shift we need to make, the mindset of our people to appreciate measurement, data, how does that impact? We can't speak of innovation or innovative techniques, research, if we do not appreciate or even have access to all the wonderful research databases if we don't know how to do it. Now to measure and even to incorporate ICT to collect that data, we need transparency. We need clarity in what we do. That's a lot of information. Yeah. And a number of things, the mindset, we spoke about this, but I mean, mm -hmm. you have other persons out there thinking the same way. Data collection and how we use that data, research and policy. I go straight to you because I you know, this is right up your alley. All right. But persons have mentioned data is, is a prerequisite, but then you can only get a desire to build those databases if you first have a desire to systematically answer the questions of, of the day. Once you are trying to systematically answer the questions of the day, you're going to recognize that you need data to do so. And I think perhaps because we have not inculcated that culture of systematically trying to answer questions in some sort of objective way, there's never really been a need for most persons to ask for data because there's not necessarily that request for the data. Most persons don't build it in the first place. And then you sort of have a, 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 a vicious, a vicious cycle. I think there is some some scope for for government to, and I think via the open data portal, some strides or some steps in that direction have been made. But then it comes from a desire as well to say, I'm not just going to think what I believe the solution is, but I'm going to have to sit down and sort of shake the tea leaves, as it were, to get a sense as to what is the best approach towards achieving it. And that requires data. And once you have that ground swell in terms of that desire for data, it then pushes the needle a bit in terms of saying, well, to satisfy that ground swell, we need to build those databases. But it, it, it comes from desire first, and then that leads to the, the databases. But I think the open data portal has been one sort of way to, to so try to do that. So hold that right <coughs> there. We, we have to go to a break. When I come back, we'll come back to you on this. No because I think some of the, the, the point was there's a lot of um, data out there already, but it's not being brought together. Right. Mm -hmm. But we will I'll come back to the panelists after the break. So we take a break. We come back in a moment. I don't I'm innovative. Sure! I'm competitive! <laughs> Productive. I am creative. I constantly improve what I do and how I do it. I am output oriented. I never stop learning. I give up my best always. The National Competitiveness and Productivity Council embracing excellence. So, welcome back. We're discussing with our panelists. How do we achieve a more competitive solution? We ended on a point of, of data, and I know that it's, it's uh, uh, <laughs> a topic that could go in different directions. So mm -hmm. I know, Kurt, you wanted to contribute. Well, <clears throat> from an educator's perspective, the use of the word data and the issues highlighted is, um, is an incorrect use of the word data because data exists, whether it exists in paper format whether it exists in um, anecdotal forms, there is a lot of data. One of the problems that, that, that exists is that we may not have agreed as to how to store the data, but more importantly, I think the bigger problem is the analysis of the data. Because storing the data in a database, whether we agree on the database or not, is absolutely useless because it is the interpretation of that data. Mm -hmm. What information that data gives us is what is it that we really need? Mm -hmm. Because you could store the data, and, and there's a <coughs> it's a challenge. Data analytics 
is an area of study all by itself. Mm -hmm. Persons who could take that data and draw correlations between different things that exist within the data that other persons may not recognize. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, then other persons can say, ah, I can use that to do A, B, and C now that they have done the mm -hmm. analytics on the data. So I think the issue really... But because you need to bring the data together as well. You need as to much as that may be the case, even if you bring it together, if there's no analysis right. of the of data, the data yeah. because right. all the data could be done, it makes no sense to me. Yes. It is only when the analysis of the data is done and the different correlations have been drawn, then persons can utilize the information yes. to make decisions. Yeah. Yes. yes, I wanted <coughs> to support what, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. what, what Kurt was saying. I often hear at meetings, there's no, no data, there's no data, but I, I think it's more than that. The data is there's the use and the application of the data. One of my favorite quotes is by um, F. Drucker. It says, we cannot, what we cannot ma measure, we cannot manage. In other words, you often hear people developing policies, but what, what is the, the scientific basis upon which this is done? So they think that girls are outperforming boys. What is the statistics say? What is the analysis of the data that you have from CXC? say and then when you've analyzed that like Kurt says then you can develop policies that will meet those those needs so I don't think it's so much the data I think the storage of course in one common way but teach people how to how use to it or get the experts that can use it and interpret it make it mean something and then drive policy development mm -hmm. I think just to add to add to that the quality of, of the information and the data is important as, as well because you could only make yeah. <laughs> inferences <coughs> if it is That's collated different. or stored in a manner that allows you to make those inferences. So if you wanted to, let's say, look at a particular area, if it's not disaggregated by, by gender right. or disaggregated by, by district or disaggregated by, by this area, then having all the data in the world will not allow you to answer the questions of the day. So we, we do have to think about that a pathway to becoming more productive and to becoming more competitive is trying to understand how could we achieve this particular outcome. But data is an integral part of how you achieve that outcome because you need to flesh out mm -hmm. options. And you can only flesh out options if you have a sense as to what's the information saying. How we store that information is important. How we codify that information is important as well because the accuracy within which you do that at least you're garbage in, garbage out. So right. if, if, you, if you collate that and you codify that incorrectly, then it's you could be the best data analysis in the, the world. You would not be yes. able yes. to make True. inferences. So these are things that I think we must put on the, on the table and, and get the populace to understand and, and appreciate. And I think to the extent that we could do that, we could start moving so, in the right direction. So get, go ahead. But let me ask you <coughs> a question. OK, you have stored the, da the data. You have analyzed the data. Mm -hmm. Who has access to that data? Right. How do I, as a private citizen, get access to that data? Mm -hmm. I think that is one of one of the things that we've that's definitely the sharing of information. That's that's information. Sharing, right. sharing of information. information. Even between government agencies, you may ask for data, and they say no. And like I'm right <laughs> next door to you. <laughs> I think I'm literally one floor ahead of yeah. you, and I can't get this data. We we need to understand that. Information, I think we live in an age where information has been weaponized. So I could easily say, oh, well, you only want that data to make me look bad. Or what you're saying is fake news or whatever. And then persons now try to guard information. To what purpose or to what end, I'm not sure. But if we have a common, well, we may never have common outcomes, but if we understand that we are all working towards each of us a particular outcome and what have you, and that data is integral to that, sharing of, of that data, yeah. making it accessible and making sure that this quality information can allow for each of us to achieve achieve our, our, our particular outcomes. And that was one of the things that was highlighted by the other contributors to, to the clip that we saw. Mm -hmm. And it was about um, having that cultural shift, that common mindset from the beginning. And if you have that mindset, and one was also spoken mm -hmm. about is development in this sort of five-year cycles that will not allow for us to grow and develop because the policies change and the directions change. What are your views on that? Particularly from the <coughs> business <coughs> standpoint, is that something that, that the hampers, especially when you have things like um, your, your importation of goods and the discussion about a, a common single market to a common single port, community port window, so that you have all your transactions happening? 
Well, for us, it's a serious hindrance because a lot of things from the government side will need legislation. To change something, you need legislation. To get legislation done, I know pieces of legislation that's 12 and 15 years old, yeah. and it is crucial for the manufacturing sector or the business sector. And you have draft upon draft upon draft upon draft, and the government change, and the next AG chambers come in, and then another set come, and they change something else, and it just goes on and on. And just the other day, we said to the government that um, a business cannot sit down and wait for 12 years for you to amend some legislation. That business will shut down if they have to wait for this to happen. So they have to look for creative ways to be productive and to be, be competitive, competitive, to continue managing their business. They have debts to pay. So to us, that side of it is really, really tough because I listen to my friend here, and it's about five years now, government is supposed to have open data. That legislation is not finished yet. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so there's a lot of pieces of legislation that's just hanging, and it affects the manufacturing sector and the business sector on a whole. Open window, that's a sore point. It's long, it's long overdue. It's, I, so it's from 2009, the discussions. It's more than 2009, and we could change in it, and it changed again, and the next one comes, and it changed, and it keeps going back and forth, and it is a way that you can get one piece of a business person to get something cleared in a particular way or particular ministry. You may have to go to three different ministries to get a license, mm -hmm. to get a permit. Mm -hmm. So open window will resolve all of that. Everything can be punched in and done. We heard the wonders of Asicuda. Asicuda is still not doing that for us because you still have ministries that are not on the system that cannot approve anything on the system. Mm -hmm. So for us, the time these things take it is a hindrance to business. You cannot be competitive if you have to sit down and wait for a piece of legislation. How can science and technology <laughs> improve that? Because this is really technology <coughs> becoming an interface so that you have greater dialogue, greater sharing of information. No, that's him. <laughs> Not that. That's him. She have the brilliant minds and they have them. But that's him. Yeah. So policy. That's, that's policy. I'm policy. happy you passed it over that's to that's policy. policy. That's, that's fine. That's fine. Policy. I try to protect I you a little bit. No, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's fine. I, I think in, in some of the public pronouncements, uh, you would have heard both the, the, the Minister of, of Finance and the Minister of Commerce as well speaking about this e-government platform and, and moving to a case where you have more e-transactions to, to facilitate some of the same things that we are discussing at this session because once you take away some of those hindrances in terms of just treating with government in the first case then it, it frees up a lot of your resources or whatnot that can be put to other effect or to other uses so there is quite a work quite a bit of work being done with respect to facilitating that e that e uh, platform as it as it were i know in January 2020, the expectation is to start small, the driver's license, and then really roll that, that e-platform out to, um, to a number of other services. I know the Department of Public Service is spearheading this initiative, and some work has been done. I believe the <laughs> pace, and it is probably, probably a case of persons are saying do more if less, because you guys should have <laughs> uh -huh. at least 20 years ago. But mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it, there is a recognition that particularly 2019, 2020, where we find ourselves with <coughs> so much technological advances um, in front of us, we need to make use of those. Yes. Mm -hmm. we, we are with, so the progress mm -hmm. is too slow. As it is too slow for yeah. business. Yeah. 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 So we, we go to another break. And when we come back from the break, we'll go straight into our third clip. Now, our third clip introduces the CSA and their views on how it is that we could become more competitive. Okay. So let's take a break. We will be back in a moment. I want to transform St. Lucia. I want to make my mark. I want to make a difference. Through research and innovation, we can transform our country. Improve the lives of all St. Lucians and give our fair Helen the competitive advantage. Research calls us to investigate, study, and reach new conclusions. Which allows us to innovate, to create new methods, ideas, products, 
and technology. Join the discussion during Productivity Awareness Week, October 14 to 18. Under the theme, Embracing Competitiveness Through Research and Innovation. For more information, follow and like us on Facebook at Solution NCPC, the National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, Embracing Excellence. From a union's perspective, we view competitiveness as something that can increase our productivity significantly. Uh, but first we have to ensure that the people in the system are well prepared for that. And so employers need to begin to rethink that it shouldn't be a master-slave environment, but rather an all-inclusive approach where employees now will feel more compelled getting up in the morning to come to work and the employer in return providing them with all the necessary tools, the environment to keep, make them comfortable so that when they are at work, they can give to the public the kind of uh, representation that the public is coming in for. The other aspect is that we also have to continue to emphasize on our workers that they need to have a change in attitude, that a full day's pay work should, is necessary at all times, and so we expect you to be able to get up in the morning, go to work, carry out the duties assigned to you, notwithstanding the issues, problems that you may have. And of course, if we do have support systems, we know that the problems that the workers are facing, we can always channel them for that support system. The other aspect that can make us very competitive is that of legislation. Currently, we do not have antitrust legislation in St. Lucia, and so we have quite a bit of monopolies. Whenever there is monopoly, you can never, ever have competition. Even our legislation in relation to taxation has no effect if there is no competition. The other aspect is our communications. We need to improve communications immensely. Our road network needs to be more efficient, meaning that you're supposed to be able to move from point A to point B at a much quicker rate. Uh, our users need to be properly educated in terms of the time. I'll give a typical example, by Laplace Carinage, Every one vehicle that passes, one human being passes. That is a significant setback to an economy. And maybe if we had a walkover, taking into account the, the persons we are physically challenged, the flow of traffic would be smooth, and so business can move much faster. And so all of these matters need to be addressed. Uh, we need to take care of our, our social ills, because it also has an effect. Because if our people are not doing the right things, investors will not want to come here. And so even our tourists will not want to, to, to be here as often as they quite do right now. A lot of information to, to digest. Mm -hmm. So communication network is spoken of. Fair day's work. I know you were shaking your head during that clip <laughs> for fair day's pay. I think this is a sore point. I think employers have raised that as well. The work ethic, is a, is a, there's a lot to be desired. Um, the social ills, the environment. We have a lot of sick buildings. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it is more common or if it's that we're more sensitized. But we have a lot of sick buildings. Our newer buildings are now turning out to be sick buildings. Less windows, mm -hmm. more glass, mm -hmm. AC units. Mm -hmm. Who wants to address it? Well, from an engineering research perspective, the, the, the challenge of sick buildings is not because of AC or glass. Uh, it's, it's a design issue, really. And persons have to recognize as well is that if you want the nicest building at the cheapest cost, you're going to have a high operating cost. Um, if you look at a lot of those buildings, you ask yourself how much engineering actually went into it. We have an issue here in St. Lucia where persons do not want to pay for professional services. So because a guy can install something, you just hire an installer and you do not engineer it. So guys come in, put in air conditioning units, poor ventilation in the buildings, and then you wonder why the building got sick. The building got sick because, yeah, it's cool, but it has not been engineered to ensure that there's proper ventilation and into the, the building. Mm -hmm. And there must be ventilation into the building. So you, you have those issues. You have designs that are, are drawn up for persons. <coughs> but the specking of the glass requires that if you want this much glass, because of the amount of sun, you need to have a, a three-pane glass. 
for the three pane gas is four, five, six times the cost of a single pane gas. I can afford that, but it still looks nice with the glass. <laughs> so I put it, it works for a year. But afterwards, you start to see the impact of not using the specs that it was designed for. The quality, <coughs> reduced quality, and so you get those out. So at the end of the day, a lot of the buildings that, that are falling sick is because those buildings <coughs> have not been engineered properly or persons have not followed through with what the design called for because of cost. So they're doing more with less. <laughs> now, now let me just, just um, indicate here that we do have an in-studio audience and at any point if our in-studio audience wish to ask a question of the panel or make a comment, you're free to do so and I'll acknowledge you. So I, yes, go ahead. At the risk of seeming a little controversial, I want to make a statement. I think our public service has the unique ability of of placing square pegs in, in round holes. So someone has a master's in biodiversity and you put them in policy. And you take the policy person and you put them in renewable energy. And the renew renewable energy expert, you put them, let's say, fisheries. And so persons are in an environment where they don't really, while we can learn in whatever environment we are because we are intelligent people. There's a mismatch of skills. Yes, yes. The skill set that you went to develop and, and acquire, you're not actually implementing it. In addition, our employers, I don't think we have a culture of celebrating people. So someone does well, there's nothing for that. So persons may feel demotivated. They may feel underutilized. They may feel unappreciated. All of that can contribute to their lack of productivity. And then again, it may just be the person's attitude. Like Paul and I were discussing, you come into the office, they come in late, then they have to go to the bathroom, then they go get their breakfast, then they have to greet all their friends. And by that time, two, three hours have have passed. I remember coming into a, a government um, organization and I told the lady, I'm in a bit of a hurry. I'm, I'm on my lunch break. And she said, me too. And you know, she <laughs> proceeded with her lunch. So, so sometimes I, I, I think it's, it's a combination of, of, of problems. And each of these have to be addressed in one way or another for us to be truly competitive. What about the communications network that was spoken of? And very... Um, Recent, we got an example of loss of productivity, man hours, and loss of productivity with just closing of a few roads, <coughs> and everything comes to a grinding halt. I know it affects the business sector, it affects every sector, schools, everybody's affected. Our communication network <laughs> is an issue. Is it an issue for the business sector yep. as much as it is for the private sector? It is a serious issue. But I am laughing because yesterday, for me, I left work 10 past 5. I just told you what happened to me yesterday. I live at VG next to St. Mary's College. And the police were standing on the junction coming down Pave on that road. I work right next to DHL yes. on Upper Bridge Street. And she said to me, you have to go up the morn. I said, miss, if I go up the morn, I live at VG next to the airport. Where am I going to to get to Viji? Miss, you have to go up the morn. So there am I going up the morn to the back of Sir Arthur, all down to the back of the morn into Pave to come back up to this way, to come back down. And I'm saying to myself, I reach your minister seven. <laughs> and it was not me alone because going down this Pave road, the amount of traffic I met on the road, and I realized they were just diverting everybody everywhere because you couldn't go because of this opening on the... So to me, that was so unproductive. But on a regular basis, we have that issue. And persons dread going up to Grosely because you know you're going to lose essentially an hour. An hour, an hour and a half. And no, I could I imagine a, a delivery. I don't know how persons mm -hmm. like the pizza mm -hmm. delivery guys do it. And I guess <laughs> yeah, that's why they had likes. to remove the, if I don't deliver within a certain time, <laughs> it's free. They can't make it free because they But you notice what they business. have done. They have motorbikes. They have now, <laughs> do, they do delivery from, by the cinema. They do delivery up north. So they became innovative. They do delivery from town. Yeah, they stopped doing certain so areas. So they stops and they don't go everywhere anymore. <laughs> So they had to cut back, look at their locations, and see, okay, I will serve this little area. So for you to try and maximize and still sell your product, you have to think that way too. And as a business person, when you have to go up north, you have to either get your workers to leave the office by a certain time, you go and do what you have to do. But you cannot, I know one that goes backwards, 
backward constantly yes. because going up north on the main road is a nightmare. But, uh, <coughs> but, but I, I just I want to ask Janai just mm -hmm. one question concerning this as well because some of those same issues form part of uh, the medium term development strategy. And I know you may be more acquainted with it. Um, how do you think moving forward we might be able to address some of those issues that would bring some sort of relief to the business sector in particular and the common citizen for that matter? I think Mr. Harris alluded to, to the way forward in his, his earlier remarks when we speak about design mm -hmm. and, and we speak about processes and what have you. Many of the challenges, whether it be of the road infrastructure or, or the communications network or what have you, a lot of it stems from planning and design. The extent to which those two things <coughs> went hand in hand and as you built out the, 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 the city, its suburbs and what have you, to the extent that those two things were absent or present, we are now dealing with the, mm -hmm. the, the consequences mm -hmm. of that. So the way forward would really be in design and the processes that go into, into that, that design. Um, I know towards the tail end of last year, we had the MTDS labs where persons from multiple sectors were brought together for almost three to four weeks yeah. to treat with six thematic areas and recommendations in those six areas were done, collated, and the intent being to sort of give effect to some of those recommendations over the coming, over the coming years. So that process is well in trade and the team from Delivery Associates and what have you is on island working with the various line ministries to achieve and give effect to some of those recommendations and that is supported by the Caribbean Development Bank. So some, some work is, is, is going into treating with some of those things but <coughs> more would have would have to be done as as well because that is just a first or second step as it as it were more will be have to have to be done but design and planning i think are critical but i, I want to add something to that though there there's pre-planning mm -hmm. but there's also post-planning mm -hmm. yesterday was a post-planning issue mm -hmm. the, the traffic management issue and if you watch Anytime there's a need to close any road <coughs> in Castries, mm -hmm. there's a disaster because mm -hmm. there's poor planning mm -hmm. of how to manage the traffic yeah. and where you divert the traffic from. Yeah. So, for example, we generally, when you look at how the police manage the traffic, they manage it near the point. Mm -hmm. But the traffic management has to start way before the point mm -hmm. so that you can start to divert traffic even before it gets to that critical point. So you have the, the, the planning after the fact that needs to take place, which is generally poor. Mm -hmm. you, planning also involves, for example, if you are sending persons through the back roads, asking all persons who have their vehicles parked on the roads, hey, you need to move your remove vehicle your today vehicle because basic. you need to have the two-way traffic, traffic flow. Mm -hmm. That is part of planning because mm -hmm. we know the constraints of our road network. It's not going to resolve yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah. So there's that real issue. But there's the other issue that we are not taking into account, which is the user, mm -hmm. where we will still stop and park our cars badly, seeing that there's a long line of traffic there, <laughs> and walk away, knowing full well that we are in a position that will cause a problem. Mm -hmm. But then we'll say, oh, the politician don't see to make the road wider. <laughs> 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 and if they don't see, they should not have done that today. It's, yeah. it's the same as the story of the guy who throws his fridge in the river, up the road. Yeah. Then comes down two days later by the bridge, see it blocking the bridge and saying, Man, say these people are really nasty, they throw their fridge <laughs> in the river. But that's his fridge. <laughs> so a lot of the problems with the traffic issues that we have, we have limitations on our space. We've already had yeah. poor design. Yeah. But there is user issues where yeah. we as users of the roads mm -hmm. use the roads badly. Mm -hmm. And there are the issues of how we plan and how we mitigate when we decide to do something. Mm -hmm. This issue could have been resolved with a proper PSA of constantly reminding persons that this activity was going to take place because most persons didn't remember about it, mm -hmm. and advising persons from early, hey, divert through there, ask person, so she says she's going to VG. Why are you sending up the one? Mm -hmm. That's the one person you do, you allow to go into town. Mm -hmm. Somebody will say, hey, I'm going to grocery. 
go up the mound, pass through, and tell them what is the route to take. The back route, So especially. that they don't go down any wrong road. So mm. why would I'm going to Grozile, go down through Rock Hall? You say stay on the ridge. Go all the way through Kakojiwa. So you, you, you advise the persons what are the routes to take. Mm -hmm. Because there are multiple routes that could make them get back into town. Mm -hmm. But she's like, but I'm going to VG. Why would I pass? And she's thinking of a route to take to get to VG. <laughs> yeah. And there are multiple routes from on the one that she could take to get to VG. Mm -hmm. But which one? Okay, you're telling me to go up on the one. But which, which one should I take? That's mm -hmm. part of the whole planning process to advise persons how to mitigate the traffic mm -hmm. that she might not have taken two hours to get that even if she went up the moon. Mm -hmm. So it's planning after the fact that we've done a bad or good design. Mm -hmm. But it's also the users need to recognize that they too play a role in causing a lot of the issues that, that, that affect us. Let me, let me just, just hold that point, <coughs> Twala. We're going to go to uh, the, our next break. But when we come back, I also want to speak to the issue of the ease of doing business in St. Lucia. Not just our ranking, mm -hmm. but is it easy to do, conduct business in St. Lucia, open up a business, open up an account, conduct business in general? And I know you're best placed to speak to that as well, but uh, you'll still respond to the question. We go to the break. We'll be back in just a moment. I'm innovative. I'm competitive. I am productive. I'm creative. I constantly improve what I do. And how I do it. I provide excellent customer service. I never stop learning. I give up my best, always. The National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, embracing excellence. Welcome back. We're discussing how can we achieve a more competitive St. Lucia. And before we went to the break, Paul, you wanted to add to the point, but I also want you to address this issue about our ease of doing business. Many persons complain that it's very difficult to do business in St. Lucia. Is that so, particularly for your section? That is very true. But I'll go back to his point earlier on. When we talk about planning, planning is not this government and the next government comes, they make a new plan. Because I think when I look at up north, there are areas in Redway on the left hand side by the old bridge um, entrance, the, court, the two concrete pillars. Yeah. You turn in there, that was zone mm -hmm. private. Okay. It's no longer private. So 10 years down the road, you have all sorts of public things happening there. So you keep designing an area for private, and then in the next five years, somebody put up something, and you allow, it's approved. Mm -hmm. So you ask yourself, do we have a holistic plan as to where we want to consider to be public space? What is private space? Mm -hmm. We must keep it private space. Do we know if there's something in this space that you cannot use, you cannot move? Mm -hmm. And this is what I think is creating some of our nightmare, because on the highway right now has no space left on the side of the road for anything pri public. <laughs> and we still see public things going up on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. And then five years down the road, we're now trying to widen the space yes. to get more road. It's more expensive. And then <coughs> you have to get some land from somebody because you have given that yeah. space to somebody to set up a, hmm. a business. And this to me is planning and policy. And we have to have a national plan with regards to where is private, where is public, mm -hmm. how are we going to do, and it cannot be a national plan for this government or that government. It has to be holistic, where everybody come together and make a decision that, okay, we leave this space as this, and we leave this space as that. And it is on a map, so that when you leave and when he leaves, somebody will come like these young people there and know, hey, this space is reserved for this, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And this is one of our biggest problems. Nobody passes on. So that the next person coming have no idea this space is supposed to be reserved. Yeah. And that's one of our issues. With regards to your question, Glenn. The ease of doing business. The ease of doing business will continue to be a challenge unless we can move with a little bit of more speed. Mm -hmm. I use the Productivity Council all the time as an example. I watched two persons in a matter of, I think it was about a year and a half open our commercial court. Two persons. We have meetings 
and then you are asking persons, this is what we need to do, this is where we have. They stayed on top of it. This has been in the making for years. And it was one of the things that was affecting the ease of doing business in St. Lucia. Two persons in a matter of a year and a half. And it's not, it wasn't rocket science. They just stayed on top of it and pursued. And when I talk about legislation, we have legislation that's affecting the business sector and affecting the ease of doing business. I'm not going to mention the pieces of legislation because every ministry knows what I'm talking about by now because I'm an advocate for we need to move. I love what he said. We brought in these people. They have a plan. The plan has timelines. Mm -hmm. I just sent my letter to follow up on my timelines. <laughs> and one of them have passed. <coughs> And um, the final review is supposed to be in a particular department. Mm -hmm. So I'm giving them three months, and then I go back again. But then I'm a stickler to stay on top of it because it is affecting the business sector. You cannot have legislation that's old 12 and 13 and 15 years. You cannot. It's and affecting then our ranking overall. It's affecting our ranking overall, and it's affecting the business community because every time you have to do something, to open a business, you have to run from this ministry to that ministry to this ministry. What happened to the single window? What happened to the registry that's supposed to be online? What happened to the... And I'm not even sure if the registry is finally resolved because they were supposed to be scanning all these documents. That's not finished. So how are we going to have an online registry if every piece of land, every block and parcel number is supposed to be online? It's not online. And to get it online, they have to finish the scanning. So the urgency of things for us as business people definitely is not the urgency of governments or the, private se the public sector because they have a process to follow and a business person cannot wait on that process because I want to open a business, I want to do this, and I cannot be running around in circles to do it. I have to run around in circles. But Paula, there's another, um, because I, I don't want it to, to, I hope that it's not, it's not that um, it's only on government's end that we have an issue of lack of um, competitiveness by this bits of legislation not being um, completed early. Because there is also an issue with the financial sector, access to finance. But there, apart from just the regular loans, you have persons that are not able to, business people not able to produce the basic requirements for financial That's institutions right. in order to get the loan, their cash flow statements and the like. Is there an opportunity there for business people as well to be more creative and innovative um, to get their act together as well, to get the, their level of competitiveness increased? Well, and I know you, you let are Let me give you the flip side. I was a banker. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you see. I know both happened. sides. Yes. And in all fairness to the bank, people say they can't get finance. And I say that to the manufacturers all the time. We do training. We just did finance for non-finance persons. Because a big business will have a financial controller. They'll have maybe their accounts audited. They'll have somebody to look at their accounts. But most of the micro and the medium term businesses don't have that luxury because they cannot afford it. But as I say to them, when they come into our association to join, I sit down with them and just go a simple process. How do you arrive at a price to sell your goods? Yeah. That as is the first question I ask as yeah. basic as that. How did you arrive at a price to sell your product? Because you have to buy inputs. You have packaging, you have labeling, you have staff to pay, even though it's one person doing it. You have electricity, you have water, you're working at your home, you have electricity at your home, you're using electricity for the business. You have to sit down and put some systems in place. And I said to them, take a simple notebook, <coughs> a simple notebook, and start writing down everything you bought, total it, and tell me if that comes back to what you sell in your product for, as simple and basic as that. And a lot of them do not have that expertise and that knowledge. So they just see something and they can do it. And we have some innovative persons with some fantastic products that can kill the market. But you're not going to get finance if you cannot come Can't present a proper plan. with a plan and a simple cash flow. So you, I will send them to the Small Business Development Unit, yes. is phenomenal. I send most of these persons there. 
and John Public, you can go in there. They will help you do your research for your business name. They will help you get things done. They will uh, help you with getting somebody to do the cash flow. And there are a lot of persons out there who prepare cash flows, and it's not costly. And they will help you with a business plan. It's not costly. But you need to know where to go. And that's something... The skills bank you spoke about, how do you <laughs> access it and who do you go to? And who but do that, you go to? But and that where brings to me to a, 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 an issue of the education system because we've all constantly asked that um, of our persons that you could become your own entrepreneur. You do not have to depend on getting a job. But are those skills being taught? Um, but but before, he, before he answered, let me tell you something. I, I said so in a lot of forums. We're telling every young person, become a young entrepreneur. Go out there, open your own business because government cannot employ the majority yes. of, I accept that, right? But I know places that give loans to these young persons. They have brilliant ideas, but the management of the funds is a disaster. So you send them to become an innovator. And they buy a bad car. <laughs> no, but I am not even going to the car. They find this fantastic idea, and it is a good idea. And, but there's nobody to hold this young person's hand to guide them from point A to point B because they have innovated, they had the idea. That doesn't mean they can become a business person. That's right. So I'll pass it on to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the short answer is yes. Um, I mean, from the college perspective, <laughs> all students studying business, for example, do... Um, business administration, they would do entrepreneurship, they do accounts, they do marketing, they mm -hmm. do the whole gamut of it. Um, entrepreneurship is a, a course that all students can take up at the college if they, they show wish to. I think the issue is that it is one thing to be taught what it is that you, you have to the do. Knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's another thing whether or not you practice it. And mm -hmm. I think she hit the nail on the head. I mean, I remember when I got my first thousand dollars in my pocket i never knew a thousand dollars could fly so fast <laughs> <laughs> because when you're young and you start to see a little dollar in your pocket the first thing that you're going to do is not go and be the most disciplined person up you're going to enjoy that money for the first time and what a lot of young entrepreneurs and young business people need is a mentor to help mm -hmm. them stay away from the temptation because i mean yo i have cash flowing in and mm -hmm. Yes, they teach me all of that in school, but they never give me cash to hold in my hand. I've <laughs> never had that, that experience. And it's a powerful experience having money in your hand. Especially if you come from a background where there has been luck. Mm -hmm. And you get that in your hand then now. You feel the power of the almighty dollar. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you, you're going to use that money to do things that is... And then you start to struggle in your business mm -hmm. and you have those challenges. Mm -hmm. So mentorship of persons mm -hmm. with great ideas is something that is required and i think <coughs> it, it, it brings us to now some of the institutional arrangements we need to foster that improve competitiveness venture capital has always been something that has been put on the table as a potential modality to mold those those young entrepreneurs and sort of focus them as well it has done wonders for the U.S. and whatnot, which is a much more developed society than, than ours, but there is nothing necessarily stopping us from having that, 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 that or something similar. If you look at the Mark Zuckerbergs or whatnot of, of the world, when they started without that sort of mentorship, so his mentor in, in, in his example was the gentleman who founded Napster a few years, a few years back, Before. and he is the one that showed him what you are not taught in school, essentially, and those are the things that you need to truly take your product, your design, to the next level. At the end of the day, the curriculum, society, and whatnot can only give you so this much. much. The underground knowledge and underground intelligence is what comes from your venture capital, your venture partners, and whatnot. So I, I think there is scope in some of our more fortunate members of society to say, listen, each of us can put in X amount of dollars and work with this group of person, which not only redounds to their benefit, but also redounds to the benefit of society as well. And that know-how of this is the approach that you take in terms of structuring your cash flow, in terms of structuring the structure in that, passes on the knowledge, which is what we discussed earlier, and builds your society and pushes it forward towards becoming more competitive. So I think these are modalities that we now need to 
to, to think of and encourage as, as a society. So you're talking, I think, in line of incubators and business incubators right. and things like this. I think it's very important. A, a step above. A step, a step above, above that. The, yeah, but yeah. But let me introduce, um, we have a contribution from our in-studio audience. So, so let me in invite the comment or question from our, our in-studio audience. Yeah, it's a comment and a question to follow. <coughs> I've been listening with regards to the curriculum and education, but I have not heard much about leadership. How do we build leaders? <clears throat> Especially in the classroom, we have a classroom setting where students are not allowed to be leaders in the classroom. In other words, <coughs> if I were to go to Sir Arthur Lewis, how many students actually go in front of a class and actually present their work? That is not a culture of the teaching in St. Lucia, and I believe that's a serious flaw that we need to address. Because to become a leader, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, you need to have that self, self, um, how you put it? Self-confidence. Con Self-confidence. Self-esteem. But you build your confidence by cursing this, forcing students from a very early age to be able to be leaders from the front and not at the desk. Because a lot of us can speak when we're at our desk. But very few can speak when they go to the front. So we need to change that culture of teaching. But that's one that was just a comment. The question that I needed to ask when you raised the issue of ease of doing business, and I know that the business community <coughs> believe a lot in deregulation as opposed to more regulations. Uh, for purposes of competitiveness, do we believe that deregulation is the best thing? Or is it a situation of persons on the job not doing what they're supposed to do on time? I believe, yes, the single window has its space. But is it a case where persons who have to do the job are not doing it effectively? And you rightly made the point square pegs in wrong holes. They may not be able to deliver on time. Just take that in perspective when we're dis discussing the whole question of deregulations and whether it's best for doing ease of business for increasing our ease of doing business in Saint Lucia. That's a good that's a good question because I think it's 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 important to look at both both sides of it. So I know you want to take it on. We're not asking for deregulation. We're asking for the speedy process of what regulations to come. Because in most things, um, you everybody now has a lawyer. So I can see the government trying to ensure that there is proper legislation in place before they put something in place. I have no issue with that. As a, as a business person, we have no issue with that. It's the length of time it takes for this piece of legislation to come into being before you can tell me I can do this and I can do that. Now, as a business, it is hampering me. Mm -hmm. So I cannot sit and wait for a 10, a 12, and a 5-year piece of legislation to come into being while I have my business run, it will close. So we're not asking to do deregulate. We're asking for the process of the implementation of this piece of legislation to be a lot quicker. It takes too long. And we don't have the luxury to wait on that. And then you said something about the, the when you look at what we are doing right now with regards to the ease of doing business, we cannot just sit down and look at one little piece of thing. And we have said to the ease of doing business community, we cannot just focus on what the EU is looking for. Let us make the business environment easier for everybody. So as we move along and we start looking at systems, while we're enhancing the systems, you'll be fixing what EU is asking you for in the ease of doing business. So your ranking will automatically go up. It took us a while with this electricity thing, and it was a simple thing, you know. People just needed to apply when they needed to get electricity. And they said everybody, everybody was complaining because it took too long. But if you were taking electricity off his house, you didn't apply for electricity, he did. So Lucilek had to find a way to deal with these issues before they can just say, okay, yes. And then you answered to the EU, it's taking too long for you to get your electricity. So it was not a simple connection. It was because you were doing something wrong and they had to fix it to make sure that the processes were done properly. So when we answer the questions, because they call you to ask you a question, you answer the question. Sometimes when you answer it, you answer it from your perspective as to what's affecting you. You're not looking at the whole picture. And then when you finish, 
the whole country is judged by that. So that's some of the issues with regards to the rankings. Yes. But for us, we are saying if you look at what we want to improve, to improve the ease of doing business in St. Lucia, we will capture a lot of the simple things that we're being graded on. So it's not deregulation we're asking for. We're asking for speed of the legislation. And you cannot have a piece of legislation in nine and ten pieces of draft. <coughs> A business person cannot do that. We don't have that luxury. Because if I have to go to the bank to get a piece of equipment, I cannot get 10 drafts, 12 policies, 12 documents to go to the bank. I need to get it right, get my three pieces of equipment, what I want to order, the cost, the invoice, the this, and go to the bank. Yeah. So definitely, and I think also what, you, what was being hinted to is whether or not, because of what was indicated by, by um, um, birth here, um, that we have square pegs in round, ho round, in round holes um, that we're not getting things done quick enough and probably that might be part of the issue as opposed to um, asking for something brand new, new policies and stuff like this. But we're going to the next break and we come to our last break. When we come back, I want to find out from you what policy recommendations, what <coughs> recommendations you have for government in terms of how we could increase this level of competitiveness within St. Lucia, some of the things that we could do. I know we've hinted to some of them, but probably there are others that you think that are more specific. When we come back, we, get, um, our, we go to our last break right now. I'm innovative. Yeah, I'm competitive. I'm productive. I am creative. I constantly improve what I do and how I do it. I am output oriented. I never stop learning. I give up my best always. The National Competitiveness and Productivity Council, embracing excellence. T Caro in Calypso Finals. The remote control that. Hi there, this is T Caro, your 2019 Calypso Monarch. I am a living example that success comes through hard work and determination. You may experience some failures and you may have to press restart. If you do nothing and remain on pause, you definitely cannot be productive. Productivity measures how effectively you are getting the job done over how efficiently you are using your resources, like my right hand, my skills. If you are not being productive as of now, it is time to change the channel. Stay productive, remain competitive, and let your remote control that. Tell them, King Tikaro, say that. Productivity Awareness Week, October 14 to 18. Embracing competitiveness through research and innovation. So welcome back. We're discussing <coughs> how can we be, how can we make St. Lucia more competitive? What, how can we achieve a more competitive St. Lucia? And we have really a, a great discussion going so far with our esteemed panel. But what advice would you give to policymakers in order for us to achieve this level of competitiveness that we hope to, to, to get to that, that plateau, that level of um, success that we want? Well, in science, in education, in business, policy, research and policy. Well, I give a lot of thought to the topic um, having to come here. And I recall a uh, discussion that I was having with a colleague of mine from Suriname, Brian Sloop. And he, he coined it very well. We need to decolonize our laws, our structure, and our system. The issue is that we have been operating a, a, a system which has been developed, designed by our colonial masters which have never been designed for competitiveness. It was designed to ensure that we continue to feed the hog, mm -hmm. which was the colonial masters at that time. Mm -hmm. So our laws are colonial in the construct, which do not benefit us, do not work within our socioeconomic, sociocultural context. Our structures, our education system, all of those things are colonial in their nature. So they are heavy, they are very power-centered, and, and authority centric it does not allow for any sort of flexibility or mobility it does not allow it to be competitive or creative so we have to decolonize completely the way that we approach everything part of the decolonialization construct also 
is that we must move away from occupational roles to developmental duties. So we must stop telling people, this is your occupational role, this is what you must do, and change the mindset and start to tell <coughs> people that you have a developmental duty. So when we talk about developmental duties, we look at somebody who's a street cleaner. What is a street cleaner's developmental duty? To ensure that the plastic on the seal does not get to the sea, to protect the coral reef. Your developmental duty is to ensure that the fishery sector and the, the tourism sector have reefs so that they can continue to grow. That is your developmental duty. You don't have a role of cleaning the street. Mm -hmm. You have a developmental duty. And if every single person is assigned developmental duties, then you will see what sustainable development is because you have to start now with the units, which is the individual, playing a part within development. Now, when we start to look at deconstructing the colonial system that gives power and authority and prominence to different groups of persons, mm -hmm. you start to realize that no longer do those things exist. Because what you now have, and you have to start to construct, is the realization that there are different competencies and not more competent and less competent people. It's either you're competent or you're not. Mm -hmm. We may be differently competent, but competent. Mm -hmm. So somebody who's an excellent carpenter has high competency and is competent in carpentry, but may not be able to be a financial director. Mm -hmm. But a financial director can't build you a table. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to the point <coughs> of... So my recommendation is for us to decolonialize the, the, the laws, the systems, and the structures that, that operate this country. So that's a solid <coughs> point. Um, so science and technology, how do we how do, we do this? I, what, 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 what would you have to say to a policymaker that would... I think it's, it's time that the government of St. Lucia makes science and technology a national priority. You cannot have economic development and growth without a strong emphasis on science and technology. And I want to give a simple example. So the science would show, for example, that we know that plants f make their own food due to photosynthesis, which takes place in light, right? Technology takes it a step further. So you now have greenhouses with your light that stays on for 24 hours, thus allowing plants to photosynthesize for the, the entire 24 hour period rather than just in the day. What you've done by investing in that, for example, is to improve the amount of food you have, enhance your food security, reduce poverty, your people are now healthy and freer from disease and they're happier and naturally more productive. Mm -hmm. But we want to invest in other things. Maybe climate change is a, a policy, a, a national priority. Then you hear that we want to have 100% renewable energy by 2050. But these things are all interlinked with science and technology, yet there's no science and technology agenda. People are used to doing things in a vacuum. So. You do your little bit in your silo, you do mine, and then the things that are supposed to take precedence to me are placed on a back burner when it should have been and more, a more integrated approach. Mm -hmm. So I think the policy, a uh, national science and technology policy, as I alluded to, is key. In addition, I think it's time that we begin to strengthen the, the collaborations between industry, academia, and government so you don't have just the manufacturers association alone link them to uh, maybe universities that engage in research and development innovation so they can find maybe more cost effective ways to do, do something now i'm not for a one size fit all approach that you just adopt something that works in singapore but maybe we can learn from best practices of other places rather than even the wheel and finally i think an investment in our human capital in Japan, I mean, Jap Japan is an economic powerhouse, but when you look at its natural resources, they're almost non-existent. But how, how has it been able to be such a global competitor? It in invests in its, in its people. And I think it's time that we make education a, a, a priority. We often priority. complain that, you know, they give the Bajan the job, the Jamaican the job, the Trinidadian the job. But these, these countries have, I'm not sure if they're still doing it in the past, provided scholarships for their citizens. So the average citizen can afford to get a first degree if it is his or her desire without having, versus the St. Lucian who has to take a loan or, or use your parents' house as a collateral. All, that, all those challenges or leave the country altogether. And so I think making it a priority would cause a ripple effect 
in terms of collaboration, in terms of education, in terms of financing, and it will truly give us a ha when people are happier, they tend to be more when their needs are met. They, they naturally work better. You don't have to to beat them like a taskmaster, and so it changes the mindset and makes them more competitive. Thank you very much for that. Now, I, I we 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 have within two minutes. I know. Um, um, <laughs> Jenna normally summarizes only. very well as a researcher. So I give you first and then I'll end with, with Paula. I think earlier we spoke about competitiveness and productivity from the standpoint of an intent to, to, do, to want to do better and a fleshing out of the how can I achieve that intent. So the intent to do better, that comes from your societal construct. And I think that is where we need to start in terms of inculcating, whether it be through the education system, health, social work, and intent to do better. And then fostering a desire among our people to realize that the how, or the fleshing out of all of the multitude, multitude hows that you could go about doing something, that comes from research, that comes from design, and supporting that is data. So I think fostering a desire to, 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 to do better, and encouraging that fleshing out in terms of the how are really the, the, the pathways. And I think a lot of it has to do with what Mr. Harris said with respect to reconstructing our, our, our management systems. We go along with doing that. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to add that for us, we were, any government, all governments, I think should look at treating the system as a business and it's not just um, I'm a public servant and that's my role I'm a public servant but that public servant have to give something back to the general public so as I walk into you I'm your customer and we have to look at it like look let's try and finish this now and she gave a typical example of what ha her experience was I think we need to really seriously look at when we have things to do set timelines keep to those timelines finish what we have to do and move on. We cannot have things sitting <coughs> in a vacuum for 10 and 12 years. It affects the country as a whole, and I'm appealing to the powers that be, and all governments, that once you're in there, work together in harmony to get this thing done. Because if you go and look in the ministries, you have a lot of overlaps. Yes. A lot of overlaps. We don't have the resources for that. So look at how we can be more cohesive and get together and he has a good point start from the education this is what we would like done this is where we want to go this is what we have to do let's set a timeline because in the private sector you have to have timelines because if not your business will not survive let me thank our esteemed panel for the wealth of knowledge that that you've brought to this discussion i think it was there are a lot of suggestions for government um that and not just government, for us as a people that we could take on board and see how we could make St. Lucia, our St. Lucia, more competitive St. Lucia. There's a lot of um, activity happening with the Productivity Council in terms of um, a competitiveness agenda that's going to be developed pretty soon. And as we continue na um, Productivity Awareness Week, we'll be continuing that level of discussion and engagement so that we could come up with scenarios that create solutions that we want. So let me thank again my panel and let me thank the in-studio audience for this really healthy discussion. And let me thank you out there, the, the public, and join us again for another discussion where we discuss issues that affect our national productivity and competitiveness. Thank you very much. <laughs>